Hi, I'm Peter O'Toole, and today I'm joined by Derek Davis from uh, Francis Crick down in London in the UK, and Karen Hogg, who actually worked with myself at the University of York. It's the first time I've actually had the chance to actually do someone who actually works with me. Uh, although arguably, Derek, we also work together quite a lot. We, we do, Pete, yes. We've done a lot of uh, initiatives over the past few years. How long have I known you? 16, 17 years or something like that? I would, yeah, say probably 17 yeah, and I think two or three or four times a year we're doing doing something together, generally delivering courses. I think York's your second home, Derek. It is. I love it in York. I'd say two, three, four, probably at least four times a year with different initiatives. In fact, I think uh, we probably collectively all met probably on the Royal Microscopical Society Flow course when it first came to York formally, although we might have met each other at a user group meeting for the MoFlow before that. Yes, yeah, so that would have probably been in the uh, yeah, 1990s, isn't it? The late 90s. Yeah, probably. Nah, noughties for me, guys. That was it, Mike. Yeah, yeah. my first yeah. MoFlow was 2001. So, yeah, that, that, was, that was my first cell sorter was the MoFlow. What about yourselves? What was your first sorters? Well, Karen, you're mine, so sorter, <laughs> MoFlow. Derek? Yeah, my first thought was a, the, a, the old BD Faxstar. So way, way back. This was in the late 80s, I suppose, something like that. So I didn't get a MoFlo. Our first MoFlo was 1998. So we were one of the first in the UK to get that. And uh, personally, still one of my favourites, actually. It is. I think if they still made them, I'd buy one. It's Very adaptable. Yeah, the legacy model was definitely the best. It's, it's the one that you really felt at one with. You could feel it. You could feel it. That's right. I mean, I, I say that to people when, you're, when we're training them. Is you, you, know, you have to listen to the noises that the machine's making. It's like a car, isn't it? You know when something's wrong. Yeah, I prefer it when the MoFlo's wrong than my car because I can generally fix the MoFlo. I could never <laughs> fix my car. <laughs> no. No, it's cheaper to fix the MoFlo probably than your car. <laughs> it's got a service contract, so definitely, definitely it's not my money at that point, is it? So you said you love Yorkshire, Derek. Uh, you actually did your undergraduate, is that right, at Leeds? I did, in Leeds, yes. Yeah, Le Leeds was a good time. Yeah, so I think most people choose their undergraduate university based on um, social activities, maybe, rather than their actual uh, degree. I did a degree, degree in animal physiology, which is obviously pretty different to what I'm doing now. Yep. But Leeds in the late 70s was a, was a great place for music, which is uh, sort of why I chose it. So what sort of music? Late 70s, this is punk, Pete. <clears throat> punk? Yeah. The Clash, The Stranglers, you know, bands like that. And Leeds was a very big university, so they were always on the circuit. Okay. You heard of them, Karen, The Clash? Yeah, I've heard of them. I remember Bobby seeing them. Oh, this is a generational thing. <laughs> so Leeds, obviously, is up in Yorkshire, so north of England. Uh, probably only halfway up England in reality, because it stretches out quite fast. And actually neighbours York, so uh, very close to where, where, I, where we live now. But certainly I wasn't a Yorkshireman to start with, but quite happy to be up here. It's a beautiful oh, part of the country. So how did you go from animal physiology into flow cytometry? Uh, it's, well, it's a bit of a circuitous route. Okay, so when, when I left um, university, rather than pursuing the sort of academic route, I decided I needed a job. So I got a job in a cytology laboratory, which is if you know, where screening cervical smears, but because it was a very big regional unit, it also had lots of other things going on. So there was an EM part, there was a histology part, there was tissue culture. So it's actually a great introduction into, into all the technologies that we still use now. And, uh, and we had there a thing called a microdensitometer, which was not a flow cytometer, but a cytometer. It allowed us to get information about DNA content using a, a, a colorimetric method. And through that, I got in contact with somebody who had a, a flow cytometer, a fax analyzer, an old BD machine, and found that I could do the same amount of work in 10 minutes that it was taking me an entire day to do. So I almost never looked back from that point. That's the Vickers M86 microdensitometer. Probably like a mobile phone. You'd probably buy one of those that fits in the palm of your hand nowadays. But as I say, it works in a, in a sort of light loss method. You stained cells with a colorimetric dye, shift free agent, and then you measured the amount of light that came out the other side of the cell. And that's inversely proportional to the amount of DNA. 
So this is my first introduction to DNA analysis as well. So Karen, what was your first flow cytometer? Well, that was an overflow legacy when you got one bought in the department here at York. So I hadn't done any sorting since since then so that was my uh, baptism of fire with having the legacy installed and then uh, getting that up and running as a three laser system it was great fun but what about your first cytometer full stop oh, so that was an epix xl so that was the analyzer that was in um, alan wilson and pat colson corridor lab domain um, and i used that when i was working as postdoc with adrian mountford so uh, yeah that was um yeah one, one laser, three colour, little wonder, really. Uh, not so common these days, a bit like the, the analyzer. We won't see so many of those now. I, I've got to say, Karen, I don't think there's much epic about the epic. <laughs> the lights, the lights at the front were epic. I, I liked my little lights going along. Yeah, I, I remember moving to York and actually, so my first was the Fax Calibre and moving to York and there was the epics and very swiftly bought two cyans. You wanted nothing to do with that epic, so I looked after it till I took it, it was over. Was good place. reason for that. Good reason for that. But you weren't working for me at the time. At that point, no, you got me to work then anyway. Well, it was just to test you to see how good you were. To see if I wanted you to join the team, Karen. You were my first person that I actually employed ever. So that was a that was a good move, I think. And I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, too, too right. You're not going anywhere either. <laughs> so, Karen, how, so I'm going to switch now to Karen. How have you found working at York? And for my, God, oh, this is personal, isn't it? How have you found working for myself? Well, I don't know if I know this. <laughs> you're, you're in for it now. Working at York's been, been great. I mean, I, I really enjoyed the department before it expanded and had the technology facility built on into it um, and working here as a postdoc was was great and uh, I just wanted to stay within the department um, when that came to, to an end and um, fortunately the post got extended as it does for six months with some pump priming money and that allowed the technology facility to come on stream and for you to appear and then to uh, yeah advertise the post. Otherwise, I would have I would have I would have gone. Um, so I was delighted when I had the opportunity to stay. And moving into the technology facility has been brilliant. It's just been exactly what I wanted for staying in science. Didn't want to be a PI. Didn't want to do another postdoc. Wanted to stay doing a range of things and um, working more with the technology and the applications. And yeah, it's been it's been good. And uh, Fortunately, yeah, I, I would say you haven't stopped being a postdoc. You are, I, I think the role you have is very postdoctorally minded. You're still doing research, you're still adding to research. It's just you're a, a super sub is the wrong way to use it, but you're a floating expert that jumps into people's projects so that's postdoctoral experience where it's really needed. I think Derek, you'll agree as well yourself. Yeah. I, th I think most people who end up in core facilities are like that. We end up there because of the range of people and the range of different applications and the range of science that's being done. So we can dip in as and when we're needed. And uh, I think that gives you a lot of job satisfaction as well. Yeah, sometimes it's training and sometimes it's more what we term as full service work where you, you know, take the, the paper or take the application they want and work it up and sort it out so that it's then fit for publication, hopefully. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really good, really good mix and it's been, been, you know, good fun. Challenges, learning, all sorts of troubleshooting as well as uh, fun along the way. Yeah, yeah. So our, our users are on a bit of a journey, aren't they? They've got a question, they want to get an answer and, and we can input into that. We can help them on their way in, in all sorts of different ways. So as you say, Karen, sometimes we're training them to run everything themselves. Sometimes we do that for them. Sometimes we're helping them with the results and the publication and so on. And it's a and the protocol. Yeah, working at the protocols are really important as well. Yeah, it's a lot of solution finding because often the protocols are different instrument, different cell line, different parasite, different bacteria strain, and oh, sample specific comes into the um, conversation a lot with working up. Um, yeah. uh, I think at the same time, though, we have to be cognizant of what's happening in the in the field, don't we? So that's another great aspect of the job in that we get to play with the new technology. So, you know, we talked about the epics and the facts analyzer. 
they both work in the same way that cytometers work now, but almost everything in there has changed. Isn't it? So I, I did two color analysis 30 odd years ago. Now we can do 30 plus. And we've got different detectors, we've got more lasers. It's all changed. It also gives us the excuse to, um, and the reason, not the excuse, or the need to uh, travel and speak to people and go to conferences and find out uh, the next new instrument on the block or the reagents to use within them, which is also a lot of fun, as well as bringing back information that we can put into the facility and uh, you know, move it on to be cutting edge or novel, which is uh, very enjoyable and great as well. Actually, I had some quick fire questions and one of those, so I, I, you both got to answer, okay? So the first one of those was conference or lab? Where do you prefer? Derek. Lab. Oh, conference. good answer. Conference, <laughs> lab, okay. So you've got conference, conference, lab. Okay, so when you're in the office area, office or lab? Lab. lab. Both lab. Work or home? Home. Um, Mostly. Oh, Karen, you've paused way too long for that. Way, way too long. <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was it. That was a deliberate question just to get you in trouble at home. <laughs> well, of course, having said that, <laughs> I do a lot of work at home as well. Yes. Well, when I'm at home, sometimes I want to be at work, and when I'm at work, sometimes I want to be at home. So it depends how the mood is for me and for everybody else. <laughs> But again, I think you know, we all sort of thrive on the interactions that we get, whether it's at conferences or in the lab with, with our lab, our flow lab colleagues or our, our users as well. It's all very important. I've got to say, during, uh, during the COVID lockdown, I've missed conferences to a degree, but I think the, the virtual interactions have been really useful to at least give some of that contact with. I know I, I, it's not your network. In, in my case, I think it's actually friends. A lot, I would actually class a lot of you know, the people you're meeting at conferences as friends, not just a network or colleagues. Uh, maybe that's because I don't have many fr friends out of work. <laughs> I see that. So, uh, what's your feelings on that? Yeah, a lot of us have been in the field a long time and we, and we do go to the same conferences and you do, you do become friends and you make not just the professional network, but the personal network as well. And you, we know other people's families. You ask about their, their kids and so on. We see them growing up. Yeah, you get to see business a long time. Yeah, you get to see the photos year on year as to you know where where people are, what they've been on holiday, or or what they want to do next for the next year. And sometimes actually you have those conversations with colleagues and friends at conferences and networking meetings that you know also what's your plans for the next year, and you sometimes reveal a little bit to yourself about yourself through those conversations as well in terms of you know where you want to be in the next year and. You don't have the time in a busy lab to sometimes um, have that pause for thought. So it, it's, it's a good, good all-rounder. So, Karen, is, is, that, is, is that you trying to hint that you, you have a career ambition that you want to tell me about? <laughs> well, I'm in your office, Pete. <laughs> yeah, watch your back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, definitely not. I am very happy with the job I have now, and I have no intention to... Uh, move the the position i think the role is is great for me and i thoroughly enjoy it and um that's, you, that's, that's where i am you've both developed your roles though you know you, you didn't start where you are today you both so kevin we heard you went into postdoctoral derek you went into a almost a path lab yeah, uh, yeah. to a degree but you obviously moved up so derek how, how did your career progression occur what were the steps the big steps so, so obviously I, I mentioned that um, I, I found somebody who had a flow cytometer um, we started using that to do exactly the same work we were doing with the micro tensitometer so looking at the DNA contents of cycle smears and that the whole point of that was to try and automate the screening process so we actually managed to put together a grant to the MRC which was funded so then I moved to King's College Hospital in South London and did a three-year MRC grant funded project looking at that. But late eighties, this is where the money was a little bit tight that ran out. So I ended up moving to what was the Imperial Cancer Research Fund working in their core facility. And within six months, I suppose, I went to the guy who looked after the whole of the, the research services where the core facilities were and said, you know, this is what I want to do. You know, are there any barriers for, for me not having a PhD, for example, to doing this? And he said, no, what we want is people who are, cognizant and au fait 
with this technology because that's what we want to push forward. So that was my start of my career in the flow cytometry facility. Ended up starting running that in the mid nineties and have done that ever since. Grown from like small beginnings, two or three machines, two staff, to what is now nearly 30 cytometers and 12 staff. Which is huge. It's a bit big. There was an important, important, interesting point there that you raised that, you know, will I have limitations if I don't have a PhD? Mm. Uh, and certainly at York, we always ask for a PhD or equivalent experience. Mm. And, and you always bring to mind, because obviously you're a leader in the world of flow cytometry, you're expert in it, second to none, many aspects. Uh, obviously not with your hair compared to me, but many aspects, you're, you're <laughs> expert. Uh, and it, yeah, it, it made me realize the importance of always having, having that equivalent experience because people come and gain, find their niche in life, find their uh, vocation in life. And it may not be that they ever had a PhD to get there, but it makes it no lesser experience. In fact, the best people don't have to have a PhD. But don't you think someone could get your role today without a PhD? Yes, I do, because I still think the attitude of the, maybe the more enlightened institutes is exactly what you've been saying, Pete, that, that you have the right experience. Because, you know, sometimes when you're doing a PhD, you are very focused on a particular area. We, don't, we can't do that. We have to be much broader. And in fact, you know, I've, I've moved on from running the facility and my successor also doesn't have a PhD. Which is a credit to Crick, I think, having that. And I don't think that's commonplace uh, across the world. No, I don't. But uh, I think maybe people should be thinking about that because you know, we, we potentially lose very talented people by putting that potential slightly artificial barrier in front of them. And so from London Research Institute, obviously you then went to, well, it was a natural migration to the Crick in 2015. Exactly. Yeah, so that was, that was a fun time, obviously, because most people should be aware that the Crick was formed by a merger of two large institutes. So we had to merge two flow cores together. And that was an interesting time because there were, there were different personalities, there were different remits of the lab and there were different expectations of the lab. And uh, yeah, interesting and also hard time, I think. It, it took us a good two or three years, I think, to come to a steady state, which we're at now. So I, I, I guess from the outside looking in, you were always eschewing the natural person to lead the two, there was two groups mm -hmm. coming together as one core and there can only be one head. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, who was going to be the big head that that's not the right way to word it, is it? But you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I think that was always a natural shoe. And I think part of that is you developed your own international profile. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were seen as leading the field, not, not just delivering excellence within your facility, which is essential, but you'd also really develop that network and that, that international profile for delivering on a much wider scale, which was so important to Crick's mission as well. Exactly. And, and I think, you know, we, we should all be in the, that um, mindset of pushing forward things like best practices. And you're only going to do that by developing those international networks and, and hopefully leading in that as well. A lot of people are doing flow cytometry. A lot of people are doing it in multiple different ways as well, or running labs in different ways. You know, there, are, there, are, there are good things and bad things, good practice and bad practice. And we want to steer people towards that good practice. And, and just stay, I, I will move off. It's getting quite long on this career bit, but I will stay on just this a little bit longer because it was important. You, you mentioned how Andy uh, Riddell's now taken your post uh, and come up through the ranks that way. But I think it's important to share... Uh, and give your staff the opportunity to also develop their own international profile. And, and now I am looking at Karen because actually Karen's here today because you have a large international profile too, uh, which is odd because, you know, I, I'm, I'm lead of the lab. Uh, but actually you, you also now have a, a large international profile. In fact, you awarded the Royal Microscopical Society, the RMS medal, the, first, the inaugural medal for flow cytometry at that yeah. time. And that's been that's been a really good part of the job, sort of growing growing the position, and then partly because, uh, well, Pete, you've been too busy sometimes to give 
talks when you've been invited and kindly then given me the opportunity to go and talk in your place. And then after that, I've been asked um, back again or by other people. And so it, it grew by being given that opportunity um sort of on, on the back of uh, on the back of your position but then in my in my own merit as well and and that's been that's been really really good and on as well as teaching many different international students on the flow courses as well then going to places um and talking at conferences and teaching on other countries flow courses has been uh, been really nice and getting the medal was 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 lovely it was really good i was delighted so uh yeah in a case downstairs in the display cabinet <laughs> and so that's downstairs in the department not at home shall i just yeah. <laughs> quickly yeah. add to the department was very proud of you getting that medal as well and that's where you know, actually i read this is rather incestuous actually i hadn't realized just how bad this actually was because derek you're the outgoing chair for the rms section for flow cytometry or cytometry yeah. Yeah. and karen you're the incoming chair and but both of your i would i would argue both of your some of your biggest impacts are through teaching and training so training others and sharing that knowledge and encouraging others to develop their career and get the best out of science and both of you teach internationally so derek where, give us some examples of where you've taught um finland i was in croatia yeah i was with karen of course in uh, in, in finland most, most european countries um states canada and karen yeah mainly mainly europe um i've not taught over in america i've attended conferences and done some talks over there but i've not done um flow courses there so um but um yeah are you just forgetting about africa but don't worry about that oh <laughs> yes africa yeah. well i did the course. both of you yeah. both of you got a big input into the development of flow cytometry and enabling flow cytometry across uh, various regions of yeah. Africa. So every week at the minute, I have a, a Zoom training meeting with uh, members of the um, consortium for the EDCTP grant with Paul Kay. Uh, and I have, do have people from Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya and Uganda on that call, but I'm not there. So I feel like that's still a UK course, but I suppose, no, it's not. It is an international course. Yeah if it wasn't for the lockdown of the COVID period, you would have been over there, that there was a course penned. And so obviously they came to York and we did some teaching there, but the plan was to also reciprocate and go and teach even more firsthand and help train the trainers. Yeah. Uh, which so is as soon as I can, I think I will be going to Uganda and resuming that training and getting the partners from the other countries coming over to Uganda. So um, I've still got that on my to-do list and, uh, uh, yeah, can't wait to go and get that sorted, really. Yeah. yeah, you mentioned the phrase there, Pete, train the trainers. That's a big, big thing, isn't it, in, in the training world? We can't do everything ourselves. So we need to make sure we can impart the right knowledge to the right people at the right time. And that's what so, we're doing, I hope. This is a, so, Derek, you love conferences. Karen, obviously, you go to the big conferences and smaller conferences too, especially when you're invited to speak. Uh, that's a lot of time away from not just the lab, but from home mm. as well. So how, how, do you, how do you balance that, uh, that, that home work-life balance? Like, yes, that can be quite tricky. So I'm, I'm sure you're the same, Pete, that sometimes I look back at my year and I think, actually, I was, I was out away from home for 50, 60 days a year, which at the time, when it's one day at a, a time, it doesn't seem too much, but you know, that, that's quite a big time to be away from your family. Mm. Adds up. Yeah, I, I think actually I had one year where actually nearly, it was probably close to 40 to 50% of the year I did not eat at home. So what I, sometimes I get back, but with the courses you eat out with the deli guts because it's important that they bond and you network and they have, they see you in that light uh, and they get to know you personally because then they ask more questions. Okay, I think teaching courses is not just about the teaching, is it? It's about the socializing and it's about, getting people to relax and maybe ask questions that they wouldn't ask normally. And that's a big part of our yeah. job. I think the evenings out and that sort of shared eating experience and also going around York and listening to Pete's jokes and ghost tales, um, you know, really helps then enable the delegates to um, relax and ask more questions and 
ask ad hoc questions when we're we're out and about as well that then you can bring back into the sessions the following day it it does have a very positive impact but uh, i would see that i would say that my jokes have you on your knees but actually it's the ghost tour that has you on the knees for that certain specific ghost story of uh, the roman legion uh, i guess you have to come on the flow course <laughs> see these two marching on their knees it is quite a surreal experience but what else, so what else do you do when you get at home though so you, you balance that but you've got to obviously put the effort in at home so oh. Karen, i'll ask you because actually i have not a clue what this picture is of yeah so it's my husband john and isabella and rebecca and we are carving our initials into a piece of stone that's going to be part of the dry stone wall maze at dolby forest so it's still in construction it's going to take probably another three to five years and we're sponsoring the maze by putting a stone in with our initials or important anniversary dates, years. So you get to go for an afternoon and you're shown how to do the stone carving. And we've seen our stone in the maze and we were allowed to go and see where it's located. Um, and it's getting higher, but I look forward to seeing it all completed. So, so Dolby's uh, also where you run, is that correct, Karen? Yeah. Although yeah. This isn't, I don't think this is there, but you do a, a park run. Uh, yeah, Dolby is, Forest, yeah, yeah. yeah Dolby Forest has our local 5k park run so we do that when we can in John terms every Saturday morning at nine o'clock come what may so um but this is actually part of the Hardmore series so this was the um rabbit run um up at Danby um also on the North York Moors and so these are run. hilly areas these are these aren't flat runs these are quite hilly <laughs> yeah the the incline is uh quite high um so the the elevations are usually in a couple of hundred meters if not a bit more um so yeah i do walk a bit of it but not yeah. as high as when you go skiing no no not as high when we go skiing so this was uh, taken i think this is in lemon Weir in france but uh yeah that's that's such good fun i really like the running and the skiing but the skiing you're concentrating so much on what you're doing it's such a break from everything else that's going on it's just brilliant i just love it you're exhausted at the end of the week but you've had such a mental break from everything else because you've not been able to think about anything else your brain's so occupied with getting safely down the mountain and watching the children and hopefully that they also get safely down the mountain <laughs> so, so who's fastest when it comes to running karen so B, I think that would still be Isabel. So she's currently 16. So I think she's fastest, closely followed by John, then Rebecca. And I'm, I do like behind, but uh, I'm not terribly slow. Must be something in the air at York, must not it? Because obviously Pete's a professional runner. <laughs> not professional. <laughs> don't get paid to do it. <laughs> uh, I, I was doing a little bit of running during lockdown, but then I broke the bike out instead. So I go cycling now. And that counts as my exercise. But you did you not do one of the very first London marathons? I did do the 1983 London Marathon. I think one marathon is enough for anyone. Oh. And that was the third, the third London Marathon. I didn't know that. that. In the days when you had to, um, to queue up at a post office overnight to post your application and then hope you're one of the first 20,000 that got in. How many marathons have you managed to do this year, Pete, now? Uh, I, I, just in training... One a month, at least. Yeah. So, so that, that, that's going well. And an ultra here and there. So we did 53 miles as the longest run this year, which sounds dreadful, but actually the most enjoyable thing because you just eat cake throughout it <laughs> without any guilt. You just eat, I don't know, flapjacks, uh, tiffin cakes, all sorts of stuff you wouldn't usually eat. Crisps. Oh, it's just like a party. <laughs> Did you get somebody to deliver your pizza halfway round? Oh, do you know, I, I, we were going to do a 24 hour run, which got postponed. Uh, and yeah, we, we were looking at pizzas, we were looking at soups, we were looking at all sorts of things. That, and we'd have had the families there. Uh, so that would have been, that, that, so that, that's my advice. That's my get out. I meet a friend on a Saturday morning. We just run for three, four hours, uh, maybe a bit more sometimes. Just, it's just, just good fun. It's just really relaxing. Sounds a little too energetic for me at my age, mate. Oh, but okay. So what? So is that too energetic? So what's this one then, Derek? This is a picture this of you holding a cup 
But the, well, unfortunately, it's not it's not my cup. One of the things that I have done for many many years is support our local football team or soccer team for those Americans who happen to be watching, which is a team called Carshorton Athletic. Uh, Carshorton is in South London, and uh, that's after our team won the uh, the county cup a few years ago. Um, so you can see that we don't look maybe the best there, <laughs> but it was a good evening. That was the first time we'd ever won that cup. Did you say a few years ago? It was a few years ago. How, how many is a few, Derek? I'm looking that at your head there. Probably, yeah. carefully. That was uh, what, about 25 years ago, maybe. <laughs> That's a few years. It's not a few decades yet, but... <laughs> I haven't even worked that long, I don't no. think, yet. But it, it, this is my relaxation. We, I take my, my boys, I've got three boys. We, we all go down to watch Car Short and Athletic, who are in what in the UK is called non-league football. So, you know, we have very many grades of football. So, Pete, I know you're a Manchester United fan. Oh, were you just we, me. <laughs> were we to run, uh, win promotion six years in a row, we would be facing Manchester United. So, you know, we're quite low down the pyramid. But I, I, I've done this for multiple years, 40-odd years I've supported Carl Shorten. And the, one of the reasons why I keep going is because it's a, it's a very family atmosphere. You know, we get crowds of about four or five hundred. You know virtually everybody. There's no seating. You can move around. You can get a drink. And uh, yes, I've indoctrinated my children. They're, they're all Car Shorten fans. It looks like it. Oh, for, for a topic. Look, I'm like Alison brought all her things along. This is a replica Car Shorten shirt. I'm a grown man in a replica shirt every other Saturday. <laughs> Brilliant. And I suppose your, your boys have both got one. Yeah, yeah. They've all yeah. got my, my eldest does stewarding down there as well. So he's got, sort of, you know, okay. got something to keep him occupied. <laughs> that, that, that's... That's really cool. Yeah, my, my boys all follow Man U, but my dad also follow Man U. And yes, it's a family inheritance. And yes, I supported them in the early 80s when, trust me, we were not top of the league. <laughs> but that's why. Karen, do you support any teams? No, I'm not really a sports follower for media, TV or anything like that. I like doing a lot of sport, you know, skiing, running, cycling, walking, sailing, but I've never really been one for following it on the television or the media. I've tried. I did try, but just didn't work for me. So you both, you both got quite dynamic outside work activities, uh, which sound, I, I think I, if I was watching and listening to you both now, I'd be thinking this, this, this sounds fantastic. Then what motivates you to go to work? You both said that you actually enjoy work and being in the lab and being at conferences. Well, actually, what gets you up in the morning to go to work? I think for me, it's that want to push the the schedule on for the for the science for the users, and to feel like you're an important part of that work that needs to be done to you know move move their research on. I might not be the main player in the group, but if I don't go and make sure that the instruments are fit for purpose or help them get that set up right, then it's not going to be as good as it can be. And so you feel like you're, I suppose in a way you feel like you're needed. And that's a nice thing to feel like in the, in the morning that, you know, you're somebody It's not, they're not relying on you because they could do some of it themselves, but it would be better if you were there. And so you feel that you, you want to go and play your part. So and Derek? Yeah, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier about every day being, being different. There's always something, going on especially now that I'm sort of moved into training full time developing new courses and so on not just in flow cytometry but in other technologies no one day is the same you know and I like to think I'm also occasionally still needed in the lab um, as well so it'd be terrible if you got up every morning and think oh no same old thing again so, so those needs uh, you, you said you, your roles moved into training but it's not just training it's information it's networking and and Flow Cytometry UK is a UK initiative that, that sort of complements the RMS. It complements what Isaac has. But you were one of the main protagonists behind getting that up and moving forward, Derek. And you always had a mailing list, uh, which that, that, that's kind of rolled into now. Why? What motivated? What, where did your energy come from to think, well, do you know what? We've got an unsolved problem here. I'm going to solve it and I'm going to bring people on board with me. Yeah, well, I think this Flow Cytometry UK was formed in 2006, but I think 
the decade before that as well, there was sort of a bit of a need to pull everything together. So we had lots of local flow groups. We had the London flow group. I think you had one up in, in Yorkshire as well for a while. There's, there was one in the east of England, one in Scotland. And they were all acting sort of independently. And the idea of Flow Cytometry UK was we tried to pull all of that together, at, at the very least at a focal point where people could understand um, where these meetings were going to be and who was running them. But the idea of having a mailing list that now goes out to about 700 people, not just in the UK, but mainland Europe and, and beyond as well, which gives people the information at their fingertips. So jobs, courses, meetings, questions, even, you know, it's a good, it's a good place to ask maybe more local questions that you might not ask on the, the global Purdue list, for example. So you could find out somebody else who's got a particular reagent in London. And yeah, the, the motivation for that is it didn't exist. So let's, let's make it. But you needed to do it, but there's a lot of things that don't exist. It needs someone to step up to the plate and, and drive it through or to realize what's needed and to enact that so i know you brought a lot of us on board to get that going absolutely it's never it's never a one-man band is it you have to bring people in who have the right strengths and the right skills to, to push things forward and you know flow cytometry uk now also runs a yearly meeting they, those don't run by one person obviously we have the rms to help us with the um, logistics but we need people to bring in the cytometry as well so also that that's a good good aspect for other people to put on their CVs, isn't it? I've helped organize a scientific meeting and that's part of our job is to bring the next generation in. I think it comes back to us being good solution finders, you know, through our jobs, we're constantly having to find solutions. And if you see something that's not quite right, we're quite, <clears throat> excuse me, we're quite good at thinking, right, what's the solution? And if that means you need to do something, well, I don't know how we sometimes create the time to do it, but just, try and get on and find the right people to, to move that forward in the right way. Yeah, this, is, this is very easy listening at the moment because you are both very positive, uh, optimistic, uh, <laughs> happy people. But there has to have been a time... I was going to say that's just in my work life, Pete. <laughs> Look, <laughs> that's half empty. <laughs> yeah, still nearly full. You're... Your glass is bigger than mine, Derek. <laughs> One upmanship. Oh, size. So competitive. <laughs> uh, so they've always, they, despite all this positive side, I think actually working in a core facility, you have to be proactive and you have to be a positive, uh, friendly person. But there's always challenging times at work. So can you think of an example when you found things at work most challenging or what, why you found time at work most challenging? Uh, if I maybe start with Karen on that one. So I think challenging for me has been at work when I've not been able to deliver something that was expected, mainly due to a, maybe a, an instrument fault or um, some technical issues with connections or saving data. And then it's having to admit to the user that's relying on you to provide the goods that you can't. And that is only happens very occasionally, but you just feel awful. And, but it's how you react to the situation and how you then move on from it, how you remembered. And it's learning that process and how to do it in a way that doesn't destroy you. <laughs> um, and uh, then that you rebuild the confidence with the user is then the positive spin out from that. Um, and it doesn't happen very often, fortunately, touch wood, and I am touching wood, but that's really challenging. And it really gets me personally and you have to take stock, realize what it is and move on. And it's hard. I, 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 Karen, that sounds like a very fresh <laughs> memory. Uh, I think I know one example where that happened, which, which is inexplicable. It was, it was no fault of the instrument, no fault of the lab. It was just one of those things that happened, but it, it can be upsetting. Uh, Derek? Well, I think you know, your, your lab is quite big. The Crick lab is quite big. And I think when you have a big lab, you're a little bit more, um, you have a little bit more um, insurance about when things go wrong. Um, you know, if one machine goes down, you can move move people about. I think the, the problems that I the worst problems I've had over the years is when I was starting off and when the lab was much smaller. And of course, this is the normal situation for a lot of people. So, due to you know, people leaving, I suddenly found myself with two of us in a lab that had seven or eight cytometers. So, trying to deliver a service 
to everybody who wanted to use those with two people is very challenging. Even if the machines are working perfectly the whole time. It's, it's all about time management and making sure that uh, you can prioritize your work and the, and the user's needs. So what about when things are difficult to, at home and you've still got to turn up for work and, and do your work side of things? So how, how does that work? How, how do you manage that side of things? So for me, fortunately, because we have quite a big team and there's redundancy within the staff roles, if I need an extra half hour, then, you know, sometimes I can ask for it and get it. But personally, I manage it by the traveling. Um, so I've got a 40 minute commute. And so if things have gone a bit pear shaped in the morning, which I think they do in many households with the families um then you know i've got the space between the the house and the workplace and uh, that little bit of space in the car can sometimes be really useful for getting my head in the right page for then you know delivering the goods at goods at work so the commuting can be a nightmare but it actually sometimes it can provide a little bit of uh, assistance for the day you're painting a picture of commuting like on a train or really busy roads and there you are rolling oh, around the like countryside like Postman Pat. It's, a, <laughs> it's a beautiful ride in on a good day. I think the A64 can be a little bit more than a rural country road. Sometimes it can be a little bit tricky. But, oh, that stunning uh, yeah. scenery and you're complaining. It is beautiful, particularly when I take the route over through Castle Howard and over the Howardian Hills in the autumn where the changes of the colour in the trees are just absolutely stunning. And so that is really good to see on your journey to work. And the poppies in the field are, are you know, just amazing in the, in the late summer as well. A very different picture to those of us who commute from suburban London to the centre <laughs> in the winter where it's completely black when you leave home and when you get back home. And all you see is the inside of a train. Yeah, I, I, I think both of you suffer with tourists as well, though, because I, obviously in London, you're going to be full of tourists who are not going in any particular direction when you're trying to walk into work. And Karen, uh, you work part time, just it's, it's not much part time anymore. It's pretty full on. Uh, but you'll always avoid Friday afternoons because of the, the traffic going to the countryside and going to the sea uh, coast past yours. Uh, is obviously one to avoid. Yeah, certainly when I went part-time, losing Fridays was uh, very much um, the choice for me, mainly by the, by the commuter traffic um, to the tourist areas at Scarborough, Pickering and the Moors, because um, it just built from about half past three onwards and it would take so long to get home in the summertime. But uh, it did always give me a long weekend, which was an added bonus. So you, you chose to go part-time, uh, to really to balance your work life side of things with having children and you wanted to have that time with your children as well. Yeah. But do you think that going part-time has impacted your career at all? No, it, it, I don't think it has. Uh, and that's partly because of where I work. And I think with, with you as my line manager and boss, I think you've seen the benefit in keeping the right staff in place um, in the right post and building the team to cope with um, having that ability for redundancy within the staff roles. Flexibility sounds so much better than redundancy. <laughs> Flexibility, yes. So I know, and I think that that was that was important. And um, I, I don't think it has at all. Um, I think I've been a happier person by being able to go part time. And if you're happier at home, then you work better at work as well so it's it's been a win-win for for me and i think that it suited the lab and that the flexibility within the team has meant that we've all been able to yeah be happy and deliver the goods i think it's important Karen, to to build a team like that in a, in a big facility to make sure that you have people that you can trust to fill in the parts of your job or somebody's going to fill in for a, every part of it um, and communication has changed as well, hasn't it, in, in recent years? You mentioned travelling into work. It's very easy now. You don't get a surprise when you get in because somebody has told you. You know, WhatsApp and email are very easily accessible on the train. Nothing's a surprise when you get in and you can hit the ground running. I, I think, Karen, also made an important point is it's always the best person for the job. And, you know, I, I was more than aware that Karen was 
hoping to start a family when, when we took Karen on. And I know you're not meant to consider that, but I was very aware of it, but Karen was the best person for the job and proven to be the best person for the job. And if we'd have taken someone else at that time, we'd have had someone not as good, not as expert for this period of time. And it's clearly beneficial to have the best person, regardless of circumstances. Because in the long run, it's always the best decision. It was the best decision in the short term and the long term. Actually, it's created us more opportunities when she went part-time because we could get someone else in and grow the lab. And they then went part-time and we could grow the lab. And so it's been a, a fantastic opportunity, actually, to grab the best people at the right time. Derek, we didn't get to what you, you talked about, the flexibility in the lab. But what, what have you... Do you have any dark moments in the lab or the most challenging period over your career? Well, I think I'll go, I'll go back to those. It's the changeover periods, isn't it? It's when, you, when you've got trusted and experienced people leaving. So suddenly you've got a, a, a pressure point. You've got to replace those skills or you've got to do them yourself. Um, and certainly the, the move to the crick was very stressful, um, although it's obviously worked out very well. And it was interesting and exciting. There was um, obviously pressure again there to get things done by particular times. There was a very fixed timeline in the, in the move to the new building. So everything had to be um, on time. And yeah, it was, it was tricky. But you come through these things and you learn from them as well. We ever did it again, we did it differently. Some of the most exciting times are the most stressful times. I think we can take from that, that message of moving to Crick, very stressful, but Fun, exciting. Yeah. And ultimately, yeah, the end justifies the means, I suppose. Yeah. So, Pete, what do you think's been the hardest time for, for you working with us then in the period of time since you took over? Oof. What would you say for, what would your big perspective of that be? I, I think in the flow cytometry world, was was sort of problems. And, you know, we do have precious 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 ethical samples that we handle and if that sort doesn't go right you know that, that that that's quite a high consequence of that sort not going right and when you go back to the user and say i'm sorry i have i've got a, a fraction of the cells that you need because the sorter hasn't worked properly uh yeah e even if it's not our fault it still it's yet yeah, physically upsetting uh, so I think those early days was very stressful of setting up the lab and getting it running. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's probably the most painful memory I have. And I joke a lot. And so in, in, in a crisis, I will joke. And, and I also learned that some users don't like it when you joke <laughs> in a crisis uh, and, and being seen as flippant. And it's kind of my defense mechanism. So you have to really know the person to get a measure of them because they may also appreciate a bit of humor in a dark moment uh, to, to kind of make some light relief, even though we know the seriousness of it. Uh, but in some people, they don't get that humor. And I learned that very rapidly too. And that's more upsetting that they get upset. And I, yeah, that, that, that was my worst moment. It's also important with, with some users is to always leave them with some um, hope, isn't it? Because you know, we've all had experiments with our users that have completely failed for whatever reason. But to be able to point out, you know, this is why it failed. This is what we'll do next time and everything will be okay. So leave them with that positive message. Yeah, I think sometimes understanding your audience and managing expectations is, uh, is also a part of what we do, even without realising it, to sort of make sure that, you know, everybody leaves the room fairly happy. Yeah, it's the <laughs> aspect of our job, isn't it? Oh gosh, yeah. If you in the days of cell sorting, when people accompany their samples, you'd hear all their all their troubles. Oh, we've all done that. Yeah, yeah. acne aren't on the mo flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes their tears are flowing faster than the uh, the sorter <laughs> droplets. Uh, so, so they were dark moments. Well, what's have been the funniest moment you've had in the lab? Uh, it doesn't have to be in the lab. In the work work environment, so it could be a conference, of course. It could. But work-related, what's the funniest moment you've had? I'll start with you, Derek. I'm not sure I could pick a funniest moment. I think, you know, if I think about all the conferences that we've had over the years, I think we've had some fantastic evenings there. I'm not sure I could pick out one anecdote, but I remember you know, laughing uncontrollably on several, several occasions, and I think that's not necessarily flow-related, 
but it's it's the uh, it's those connections that we were talking about earlier that you have with people and it becomes much more personal and you end up having a a, a good time in a work environment uh, i think at conferences um the the funniest moment or the, one of the most memorable moments i can think of is when we were um was it at glasgow at cito and we had the kaylee at the um closing ceremony and then at the end we all sang old lang syne in a big circle and that that was really good fun actually that i, I really enjoyed that but the funniest moment in the lab i think um probably uh, would be it didn't happen to me it was when um, we were doing some um, analysis work on some um, bovine sperm samples and you have the sample in a straw in liquid nitrogen and sometimes um, the opening of the straw doesn't quite go according to plan now if you're lucky it uh, expels the sample into the beaker um, and not into your face or hair, which happened to uh, one of our colleagues. And um, so uh, we all joked that it was a new novel hair conditioner or hairstyler that uh, maybe won't catch off or be commercially viable, but it gave us all a good giggle. Well, actually, Karen Bizarre, it, 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 it was one of those uh, when Harry, it was, it was something about Mary, was it, that moment with the, 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 the flick? Uh, but not only that, actually, they were the, the straws were being sold as a perfect protein hair conditioner at one of the places I think Chester or London, one of the two places. It was actually a commercial product, and we never charged that person for his free uh, hair conditioning. <laughs> That's a classic moment in lab. You've had nothing go wrong or funny like that in the lab, David. You must have done. I must have done, but I can't recall anything like that. I did once open my um, my saucer to find two cockroaches in there. Good grief. Yeah. Yeah, cockroaches can survive anything. I think the uh, 4,000 voltage across the plates was nothing to them. So you had half the Beatles in there then? Yeah. <laughs> um, thinking of which, uh, looking back, uh, again, what would you rather do? Watch a film or read a book? Karen? Watch a film. Derek? Read a book. I don't have the uh, attention span to watch a film. Okay. I don't have the attention span to read a book. <laughs> Takes more concentration. Okay, so Karen, TV or film? Audio book. <laughs> I, I've just got sympathy from everyone now, thinking, and I have to work with that. <laughs> it's <laughs> Derek, what about you, TV or film? It's yeah. got to be TV, I guess. It's got to be TV, yes, although I don't watch a lot of TV, that's safe. So. What's your TV vice? A TV vice? Oh, I think we've talked about this before, Pete. I'm a big fan of Gogglebox. Which, uh -oh. It's one of those programs that shouldn't really work, should it? It's us watching people watching television. Yeah, so for anyone who doesn't know what Gogglebox is, you are literally watching, there's cameras on the people watching TV programs throughout the week, week and seeing what their opinions are. And it, it really is the trashiest concept that works so brilliantly well. I think it's great because it's quite life affirming. I think everybody on there is, it, it shows that people are actually quite sensible. And there yeah, is. And you can, yeah, and they, they show different walks of life, but they all have that same similar identities you can go with. And actually, it's a great way to catch up on a week's TV without having to watch TV. If given the opportunity, though, Pete, would you be a subject of Gogglebox? Actually, I would like to be the subject of someone watching Gogglebox. Because how often do you comment when you're watching Gogglebox and those that are commenting? Don't you? You do, don't you? So let's bring it back another loop on that. So, yeah, I, I, it does, you do tend to comment. But I think if you watch TV by yourself, you don't comment much. But when you watch people commenting, you comment as well. Which brings us back to training courses in a way that one of the best secrets is to get people talking. Once one or two talk, everyone joins in and getting everyone to feel and that's where the social aspect also helps so i'm sure goggle box in the uk is on a friday night and i'm sure derek wine or beer at that point it'd be wine on a friday night red wine on a friday night karen yeah definitely red wine yeah actually i'm also red wine on a friday so yes it's goggle box with a glass of red wine karen you watch goggle box don't you occasionally not not always i i think Nine o'clock is the time to, to stop thinking about work on a Friday. And it is just, you don't have to think. 
it's lovely just to relax too. Yeah. Well, as I say, Saturday, I, I don't think about work at all. It's the one day that I have completely free. Yeah, it depends what's going on. <laughs> so weekends you try and keep fairly clear, but it will always encroach a bit. You don't want to start Monday morning with too much, so you kind of get some bits. And certainly Sunday afternoons, you start to kick into gear again, certainly myself. Yeah. It's when you see the notifications on your phone and the email and you think, oh, well, I could really do with sorting that thing out. It can't wait. So we're nearly up to time. So I'm going to ask, what's the most proud moment of your careers to date? I think getting the RMS flow medal, I was really, I was really pleased and proud. I was hoping to say that because I forgot to put it up earlier. <laughs> I wasn't sure about it when I first heard that I'd been awarded it, but when I thought about it and saw the number of people that were at the conference that I'd taught or helped or advised or spoken to, and I thought, no, I'm, I'm happy with this. I'm really, really pleased. And I was, I was definitely delighted to get the I, medal. I was really ill when you, when you were awarded that medal. But uh, I still went and, and then left because I, I was just so ill that night. I just had to get home again. So, you so. Food, didn't you? Feverish, yes. I didn't realise I had the flu. The prop, flu, flu, flu. Influenza yeah. flu. Yeah, come back from, is it Singapore I come back from and didn't realise I'd had it and, oh, yeah, in hindsight, you look back and go, oh, yes, that's what the flu is then. That's pretty bad. <laughs> it's not so nice. Derek, what about yourself? I suppose it'd be something similar. I should have sent you the photo in that um, year before last, I got the ISAC membership award, which is, you know, one of those things that's sort of voted for by your peers, which is a good affirmation, I think, that you've done something right. Well, that, your, that'd be yeah. someone like that voting for you then. <laughs> something like that, yes. That's not an ISAC meeting. That's us in the House of Commons, Pete. So an Isaac is better than being in the House of Commons. I think so. I've got a plaque. So I, I think that's, that's well deserved for both of you. Uh, and your contributions to Isaac and flow cytometry in general, Derek, have been second to none. Uh, Karen, forging ahead with the, the various commitments, courses around the world, uh, the commitments to Africa across both of you. It's, these are really important initiatives as well. <clears throat> so before we get too serious, I've got to ask, it's always good fun, this bit. What is your best science joke? And if you haven't got a good science joke, just what's your best joke? Keep them clean. I definitely don't have a science joke, but I can tell you my youngest, my youngest son's favourite joke, knock-knock joke. Knock-knock. Who's there? Europe. Europe who? No, Europe. Oh, goodness sake. Oh. <laughs> so he voted for Brexit then. <laughs> I'm not sure he knows what that is but when, you, when you're seven or eight that, that, that tickles you thank you I like that Derek that's very that, really yeah. hey, Karen I haven't got any I'm just going to say go with the flow and we'll just leave it at that <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say it was just me Karen is your, fa your favourite joke is me that, that would have been a good put down at the end I, I don't need to think of the jokes with you around Pete <laughs> <laughs> uh, every day's a fun day or is it just a pun day I'm not sure which <clears throat> so one last question technology's moved forward flow cytometry's moved forward what's wrong with it what's the next big step you, you put that question in for the last minute or 30 seconds of this Pete we could have started with that and not finished now couldn't we yeah. Yeah, tactically keep it short what yeah. needs to be solved well, you know, I said at the beginning you know, flow cytometry itself has not basically changed has it but I, mean, I suppose the main thing is that we still can't detect down to the level of sensitivity that we'd like to so that's where we need to move in the next few years but whether that's with spectral flow cytometry or whether it's using different detectors we'll see yeah and is that sensitivity because of the heterogeneity of the biology that's the problem so I, yeah, that comes know, to the... I first started off looking at one color and that's all I needed and that's great if you've got a homogeneous population Virtually everybody doesn't deal with that. So we need a stunningly bright probe that you can see one probe on a cell. But you still have to label it, and that's far from ideal as well in yeah. some cases. Karen? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll echo that, but also say that, you know, the reagents for some of the, the lasers that we have could be developed further. Um, so we've got the, I think there'll be some changes in that in the near future. So we've got like the 808 or the infrared lasers, and the avalanche photodiode detectors that are not 
being utilised as much as they could be at the moment. So it'd be interesting to see what comes out for that space. I think it's great that we're still going to want to get these cells back, aren't we? So sorting is still going to be a big part of this. Yeah, I, I think, think we'll still have a job. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A few years ago, there were a handful of companies, not even a handful of companies that you'd really consider. And now there's so many companies bringing out really new innovations that are all working towards these, solving mm -hmm. these problems and reagents getting brighter as well. Uh, it's a good place to be. I think we've got a uh, flow. I think 10 years ago was fairly static. If I'm harsh, I think there's a big wave that, and that wave is only going to get bigger. I don't think it's going to come crashing down anytime soon. And I think the single cell side uh, puts flow at the, at the start of many other technologies as well, which is important. I think the sort of getting smaller, maybe more portable, the microfluidics as well is going to change quite a lot in the next decade. Um, so that'll be interesting to see how that space is filled. I think we've, we've never had something that's been a huge quantum leap forward. But if you look back over the last 10 years, as you're saying, Pete, things have changed quite a lot and we've moved on a lot. Yeah. The future I think is bright. It, oh, dear. Oh. Oh. On that note, we should finish. Karen, Derek, thank you very much. You've been brilliant to talk to. Thank you. Thanks, Bye, Derek. Thank you. Bye. Bye.